Isaiah 64. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, <clears throat> the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Chapter 65. <clears throat> he says, I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, as written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. And I'll bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit, and my servants shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that, for, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name 
for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But ye, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build in another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are, for as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And this shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, please stir our hearts to righteousness, Lord. Let us proclaim your gospel, Lord, with great boldness, with great joy, with great peace and supplications, Lord. Oh, Lord, without you, we're nothing. We're nothing, but you are everything, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord. May your spirit stir us, Lord. Lord, that we would find our rest and our peace in thee, Lord. (coughs) That our sustenance, that our provision, it would be you. It would be you. You would be our bread of life, Lord. Let your name be glorified in all the earth. Amen. Amen. You know, I love this. I mean, Isaiah is just crying out at the beginning of Isaiah 64. <clears throat> and just, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens. I mean, have you ever felt like that? You've just been on this earth and it's just so many people just living in sin and uncleanness and so much confusion and darkness and everything's always like turmoil and you just, all you want to do is just worship God. You just want to be true to Him and man, and even in the congregation, you know, like it says in Proverbs, man, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation assembly. Like in the midst of the congregation where it's supposed to be God's people, I'm, I'm in evil and there's all this confusion and sin and strife. You just go, man, God, I wish you would just rip the heavens open just come down, come down, flow down, let the nations fear before thee, you know? That's David, Isaiah is just crying out, man, you would come down, the mountains would flow down at thy presence, you know, like volcano, like, just, why? Middle of verse two, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. You know, there's a scripture where he talks about how the, the sinners and the heathen were at ease in Zion and how that furthered God's anger. He was like, no. Nah. Listen, sinners and heathen, people who don't know God, don't walk in God's ways, don't worship God, they should not be living at ease and comfort in God's city and God's territory. If they want to come into God's territory, they're supposed to come with fear and trembling and hard labor and hard service. Not casually, coolly coming in and out, man, you know, no, 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 no. Again, you know Psalm 2. 
When the sinners and the heathen are at ease in Zion, you've got problems. No, no. The way the earth is supposed to be is the people who love God and honor Him and are appointed by Him should be walking in that easy yoke of Jesus Christ. And the people who are living in sin and who are despising God, they should be in travail and pain and anguish. A lot of times nowadays, the opposite. The ones who are trying to serve God say, we're in travail and anguish and pain and crying out, and they're just cool and everything's going fine. It's upside down. Psalm 2. Remember, he's talking about the kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth in verse 2. And they, they hate God and they hate Jesus Christ. And they think they're going to create a kingdom where they don't have to answer to God. And they don't have to answer to Jesus Christ. But it's delusion because one day Jesus Christ will come and he'll break all his enemies with a rod of iron. Verse 10. So here's the instruction. <clears throat> Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Okay, this is before Jesus comes. He's giving him a chance. He's saying before he comes and it's too late. Be, receive some instruction and wisdom. What should they do? Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Amen? Let it be so, Lord. Let us not be lifted up above our measure. Kiss the Son. It's not talking about He's going to bow to you and you give Him a little kiss on His head. It's talking about you're going to bow and you're going to kiss His feet. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You know, and, and so Isaiah cries out. He's going, God, I wish you would just rip the heavens. You'd flow down. Show these people your power and your might so that the nations would tremble at thy presence so that your name could finally be known to your adversaries. You know, right now, the enemies of the Lord Jesus... And again, we don't hate these people. We want to see them come to Christ. But to them, the name Jesus is just another name. In fact, not only is it just another name, but actually they take that name and they use it as a curse word and as a blaspheming. Like, they don't just, it's not just, not only is it not sanctified in reverence, and not only is it just not, but like, it's like they use it like an evil, you know? I mean, atheists, Buddhists, Muslims, you know, Hindus, blaspheme in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go, man, I wish they, your adversaries, they would know your name. You would make your name known. But I love verse 4, Isaiah 64, verse 4. What a hope, amen? For since the beginning of the world... Men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither had the eye seen, O God, beside thee. He's the only one who's seen. He's the only one who knows what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Amen? Amen? What did Jesus say? He said, watch. He said, blessed is that servant who when his Lord cometh, find them watching, waiting. You know, not beginning to eat and drink with the drunken, not beginning to beat the, the fellow servants, but he's watching, he's waiting, he's doing the Lord's will as the Lord committed to him, exactly as the Lord said him. Watch, wait. Man, blessed. That prepared for him, that waiteth for him. Now, what does it look like to wait for the Lord? A lot of times people are confused about this. What does it mean to wait? I just sit there and cry day and night and pray. And well, maybe. Some people, maybe that's what you got to do. But um, I don't think we're supposed to be crying day and night. There are seasons of tears and weeping and crying out to God. But I don't think that's supposed to always be the season on earth. I think true repentance and crying and weeping is supposed to bring us through till the Lord lifts us out, redeems us, saves us, and gives us joy and peace. So watch what waiting looks like, verse 5. Thou meetest him, God meets him, who? That rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee 
in thy ways. That's it. That's what it looks like to wait. What does it look like to wait for God? Those who rejoice, not in their, not in flat. We're talking about rejoicing in God. Those who work righteousness, who live, do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, according to what he says. And those who remember him in his ways. Man, just a couple of scriptures coming to my heart. Acts 10. <clears throat> Acts 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So again, we get this thing backwards. I was talking about accepting Jesus. No, we want to be accepted by him. We want to be accepted with him. It's not about whether or not we accept him. The question is, does he accept us? Well, who does God accept? Doesn't matter. Jew or Gentile, every nation, those that fear God and work righteousness, do what's right in his eyes, that's who God accepts. That's who God will bring the glorious gospel and will shine into their hearts and they'll receive Jesus Christ, receive the Spirit of God, and they'll rejoice in Christ and they'll be used as witnesses on the earth to shine his glory. We were talking about this the other day, um, First Peter. <clears throat> Go to First Peter, Scripture. Remember, Jesus says, search Scriptures there, they which testify of me. Amen? So, yes, we read the Scriptures. We allow it to correct us, reprove us, rebuke us, instruct us, all those things, yes. But... If we are the end of the scriptures, then we're not reading the scriptures right. If the end of the scriptures always comes back to us, then we're missing it. <clears throat> because the ultimate end of the scriptures is to bring us to him. And so that's why he goes, man, who does God, who's God going to meet? When Christ is coming back, and he's coming in his fury to crush his enemies, who's he going to meet and pull him out and let him be with him and be part of his army. You know what I mean? Who's he going to meet? Um, those who are waiting for him. And who are those that are waiting for him? Those who are rejoicing, they're working righteousness, and they're remembering him, the him, in all his ways. Not remembering themselves in their ways. Right? First Peter Chapter uh, 3. Watch this, verse 15. He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Okay, to sanctify means to set apart. To set as holy. So in your heart, who's supposed to be set above all as holy, sitting on that throne? It's the Lord God. Amen? You go, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set him apart in your heart. Again, in your heart. That's what you really think. That's what you really believe. That's what you meditate on. That's the importance of meditating, thinking, dwelling. Sanctify him in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we sanctify him in our hearts. We remember him in his ways. That's who he's going to meet. And we stay humble and we're prepared so that any man, and this is God to help us. We need help, we need help with this. Because naturally, it might be easier for you to speak to poor people or to people of a certain race or something. But then others you kind of shy away from. No, we need to be ready to give an answer to every man who asks us of the hope that lies within us. 
Again, we don't always have to force it on them. There are times when the Lord says, go speak, go preach. But sometimes we're just living holy. We're keeping God. We're meditating. We're singing to Him. We're giving praise. Remember, a sign of being filled with the fruit of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, is speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You're making melody in your heart. I've just seen that in my life. Like Before, when I was just reading the Bible to figure out cool things, I didn't sing. I didn't sing. I didn't rejoice. It was just like a, one of my many hobbies. It was just one of my many pursuits. I'm studying, oh, this is kind of cool, you know, like, wow, this is neat. Oh, let's go watch the game, and oh, let's go do this, and oh, and, and, and Bible time, you know, like, it was just one of many things. But when you set the Lord on the throne of your heart, and you let everything be brought into subjection under Him, you get filled with His Spirit. All of a sudden, you find yourself just singing and rejoicing, even in the most menial of tasks, you know, washing the dishes. And you just sing and just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Like, you know, like, oh, where, where is this? Here, everything for him. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see. In what I do in anything to do it as for thee. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that in the action fine. You know, when you, when you do whatever you do, again, this is why it says don't be the servants of men. Even if you are a servant at a, at a workplace, don't be the servant of that man. Don't be just trying to please them. Don't just be trying to, you know, impress them to get reward from them. No, 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 no. Whatever you do, do it as unto him. Even if it's just sweeping the room, mopping. I mean, yesterday my wife, she's getting ready to put Benjamin down for a nap and She's going, I swept everything out. Everything's ready. I got the mop bucket ready. You know, can you mop for me? And okay, yeah, I'll mop, you know. And you know what? It's a joy. Mopping the floor. He's just rejoicing and singing to the Lord. And you know, like, it's not like, oh, no, I'm too good for that. I need to hire an African servant to come do that for me. That's ridiculous. No, like this is, we shouldn't be above anything. And anything the Lord sets before us so that we can do to serve one another in love, do it unto him. And you know what? All of a sudden, you'll find joy in those things. These are the people that rejoice and work righteousness, that remember him and his ways. And that's why we've got to sanctify the Lord in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us. Uh, Isaiah 64. Uh, the middle of verse 5, he says, Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. And again, he's talking about the nation. But then he points back, and he says, For in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. He's talking about in those people who are rejoicing and working righteousness and remembering him. Rejoicing, working righteousness, remembering him. There's continuance. And those of us who are doing that and continuing, we shall be saved. Okay, go to Romans 2. This is really important. This is one of the words the Lord just keeps putting in my heart is this, this scripture from Romans 2. Look, at we might be weak. <clears throat> Amen? Not many wise, not many mighty are called. You know, he chooses weak, base, you know, nobodies. But it's okay. The weakness of God is stronger than men. So he can choose us and be weak and he, can, and, and he can work in us and we'll be stronger than the strongest men on the earth in the spiritual realm. Rome, Romans 2, look what he says. Verse 6. He's talking about God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Okay, he's going to pay back everybody based on what they've done. <clears throat> You're going to be paid back for what you've done. Okay, so verse 7. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, these ones who are patient, they continue in doing what's right and what's good. They're doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. They seek for glory, not their own glory. They're seeking for God's glory and honor. Not seeking for their own honor. They're seeking for God's honor and immortality. They want to live forever. 
the Lord will give them eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they obey indignation and wrath, God will give them tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But he's going to give glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there's no respect of persons with God. Straight up. Amen? Amen. So there's no like, I'm saved, but I'm still a filthy sinner, and I get more excited about the rugby match than I ever do about, you know, Jesus Christ or the gospel or gathering together with his people. It's a good chance you're not saved. No, God, he's prepared these wonderful things for those who are waiting for him. Now, what's ironic is in the New Testament, Paul quotes this verse in 1 Corinthians 2, and notice how he changes it. <laughs> one, of my, uh, one of my teachers, when I was growing up in the Lord, <clears throat> He used to say this to me. He'd say, Paul was the greatest Bible corrector ever of all time. <laughs> Paul was always changing the scripture. <laughs> but he meant it like in a, in a funny way because cause you see, when Paul quotes Old Testament, how he like quote half of a verse and then cut the other half out and then stick another half in or quote and then change. And you go, man, it almost looks like blasphemy, but it's not. Like I, I, God just gave this guy such perfect wisdom to dissect the word like perfectly and know where to fit everything together. I wouldn't recommend you try and do what Paul did. You'd probably make a fool of yourself, but, but God gave him that kind of wisdom. But 1 Corinthians 2, <clears throat> verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that what? Love him. Isn't that cool? So in the Old Testament, it's him that waiteth for him. Waiteth for him. And what's neat is, in a sense... He hadn't come yet in the Old Testament. They were waiting. They're waiting for Messiah. They're waiting for the Messiah. Well, now that he's come, we can love him. Yeah. <laughs> now that he's come, the love of the Father has come down. And now with his spirit, we're not just waiting. Now, yes, we're still waiting. We're waiting for him to come back. But, but we love him. Yeah. See, the truth is, if you're waiting for him, you're waiting earnestly, patiently, longing for him, doing what's right in his eyes, being busy about his work, giving thanks and everything that he says before you, that's proof you love him. The thing you will wait for, and you'll labor for, give you, I'm talking about like, you know, like, like your passion, your desire. Those are the things you love. You know what I mean? When I, when I loved football, it wasn't like, oh no, another football game. Oh God, it's like, I gotta go sit watch another game. Or, or oh no, we gotta like, got a football match, hey, guys are getting together, I don't really want to play football. No, like when you love something, dude, you're, bam, let's do this, let's go, give it all. Even if you're tired, even if you're whooped, you're not looking for an excuse to get out of it. You, in fact, anything that would be an excuse to get out of it, you're going to, you're going to, no, actually, no, I thought you broke your leg last week. No, it's okay, it's not that bad, let's go, we can do this. You know, like, <laughs> it's the complete opposite, you know, and that's like how Paul was with Christ, I mean, Dude gets stoned and he's going, I'm going right back in preaching, you know, no big deal, brush it off and shipwreck. You know, so a lot of times that's why I think maybe, you know, why do we see a Christianity where everybody's so quick to pull back and bail, ship and run back? Maybe they don't really love them. Maybe they're not really waiting for them. Maybe there's other things in their heart that they really love and one little thing goes <laughs> off, that's their excuse to back off and pull away and have nothing to do. Come on, man. I remember one time at the football game, first play of the game, kickoff, I'm returning the kickoff, and I don't know, I can't remember exactly if it was my guy or so, it might have been my own guy. I was running, and I made a quick cut, and he was coming from behind, because he was actually, he was going to try to block for me, and just smash me in the eye so hard, like in my head, but bam, went down, I was like, I couldn't see, it was definitely a migraine, it was like, and, you know, you take a few seconds, and then it's like, okay, let's go. And I, I, honestly, I, the rest of the game, I couldn't even see straight. And it was one of the best games I ever played, because after that happened, I was like, let's go. I'm like, we're, we're, I, was, I was on fire. Like, you know, so, it, but that's what I'm saying. Like, if the hits and the things, and you're always looking for an excuse, maybe you don't really, 
Maybe you haven't sanctified the Lord in your heart. You know, maybe you don't really love him. Maybe you're not really waiting for him. Because, man, when something's in your heart, you're not looking for excuses to pull out. If anything, when you're taking hits, it's just you're going to drive that much harder into it. You know? Yeah. Now, at this time, back in Isaiah 64, at this time, you know, the nation was just unclean. And all the righteousness of the nation was just filthy rags. Now, a lot of people use this verse and apply this verse as absolute eternal truth. And it's a misapplication of this verse. And let me show you why. Because they, they, people say, our righteousness is filthy rags. Our righteousness is filthy. So it doesn't matter what you do in there. God's not impressed. It's just filth. You know, It's only his righteousness that matters. Well, okay, look, yeah. Obviously, we need his righteousness. We don't make up our own righteousness. But let's get the context of what was going on at this time. At this time, remember, this is the nation of Israel. <laughs> They had been given the law by God. They had been given the temple and the sacrifices and the worship of God and the service of God. All of these things were given to them, and God had commanded them and instructed them, if you keep all these with all your heart, you obey my voice, you cleave to me, this will be your righteousness. Uh, in fact, I, I won't take you there, but it's back in Deuteronomy. It says, like, if we do all these things, this will be our righteousness. Now, it's not like... Israel didn't make up this righteousness. This was something given to them by God. And if they walked in it properly, it would have been something that was blessed by God, and God would have been well pleased with it. In fact, let me just show you real quick. We might as well go to Deuteronomy and then go to Luke chapter 1. I just want to show you. Deuteronomy, I think it's early in Deuteronomy. I think it's around like maybe 6 or 7. Yeah, 6. Jeremy 6. Jeremy 6, verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is, as it, as, as it is at this day, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Okay? This was of the Lord. This wasn't they made, they didn't make, these aren't like heathen just making up their own religion and making up their own sacrifice. Yeah, all that is filthy rags. If you make your own way, it's going to be absolute abomination in the eyes of God, okay? But that's not what Israel was given. Israel was given something good. And if they did it with the right heart, it would have been good. It would have been something that was, it would have been a righteousness unto them, and it would have exalted them above the other nations. Again, look at Luke, Luke 1. Luke 1. Verse 5 talks about there was the certain priest named Zacharias, talks about his wife. She was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Their righteousness was not filthy rags before God. You think God, when God clothed Adam and Eve, you think he gave them a bunch of filthy, unclean garments and said, here, this is your righteousness. No, like... So the righteousness of the law was not filthy rags. Because again, in the context of Isaiah, a lot of people speculate that filthy rags is talking about like in the Bible, like what a woman would use, you know, the menstrual cloth. A filth, you know, I could talk about like something filthy and unclean. And that's what Isaiah is saying, all our righteousness are filthy rags. I don't believe the, the righteousness of the law was filthy rags. The righteousness of the law was not the eternal righteousness that ultimately man needed. Man ultimately needed the righteousness of Christ to come and be imparted to them in the new covenant. The righteousness of the law was a temporary thing, but again, look at the priests. God didn't tell them, 
hey, go out and play in the mud and then just get some dirty garments and come in before me. No, they had to have clean garments. Um, and again, let me show you one more proof, Revelation. So a lot of people, they misuse Isaiah 64 and they're confused and they misapply it. And again, a lot of people, they, they use it like this. Jesus is the only one who's holy. Jesus is the only one who's righteous. He's pure. I'm just a filthy, my righteousness are just filthy rags. But because he's with me and I'm with him, I'm okay. You know, that's not really what we're teaching or what was being taught or that's not what Isaiah was talking about. Again, Revelation 19. <clears throat> Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. And then she was waiting for him. She loved him. She was, she was rejoicing and working righteousness and keeping him in her heart, you know? Yeah. Amen. I won't say anything. But verse 9. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of who? It's the righteousness of saints. not the righteousness of God. It's the righteousness of saints. And yet, it's of God. That righteousness, she didn't make her own garments. It was something given by God to her. And she's clothed in fine linen, clean and white. And that's the righteousness of saints. So to say all our righteousness are filthy rags, that's you as a lost person without God. That's you doing your own thing that's right in your own eyes. So in Isaiah, the reason why Isaiah cries this out, it's not because... If the nation was like during the times of Josiah, where they had a king who feared God and everybody's keeping the Passover and everybody's serving God and fearing God and doing what's right, he wouldn't cry out in that time and go, all our righteousness are filthy rags. No, he's crying out in a day and age when the, their iniquities were carrying them away like the wind. Verse 7 there's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. He's looking at a day and age when like the whole nation had departed from God. And they're still doing temple sacrifice and all that, but their hearts are so far from God. They've twisted everything. They're doing it all the wrong way. And he's going, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Believe me, that's not what God gave them in the law. He didn't give them filthy rags to cover themselves. They took something that was clean and good, and they defiled it. They defiled it. Again, go to Revelation 3. You can do the same thing in the New Testament, by the way. You can defile what the Lord gives you. So let us fear before him. Revelation 3. So again, just trying to give some context to that verse, because I know it's misapplied a lot. Revelation 3, uh, verse 2. He's speaking to the church of Sardis. He says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, if you're not going to wait, you're not going to repent. You're not going to watch for me. I'll come on thee as a, th uh, as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. But watch this. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath in here, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay? So Christ gives us garments. When you're born again, Paul says, you put on the new man, you put off the old. Put off the old. Don't walk in this junk anymore. Put on the new. Walk as children of light. Don't defile those garments. Yeah. You defile those garments. And you start slumbering, you start sleeping. You say, he's going to come on you, but you won't be ready and waiting and know when he's coming. He's going to cut you off like a thief in the night. He's going, but... You've got some. They haven't defiled their garments. Guess what? They'll walk with me in white. I'm going to give them that fine linen, clean and white, and it's the righteousness of saints. 
It's not the right, it's it's the righteousness from Christ, from God for the saints. He has a righteousness that he wants us to wear. At this time in in Israel's history, all their righteousnesses were as filthy rags. And and again, all their righteousnesses. He's not even talking about their evils. He's talking about when they were coming to temple and trying to do what was right. It was all filthy, defiled rags. Does that that make sense? That's the context. Nobody was stirring up themselves to call upon him. Now, when he says nobody, it doesn't really mean nobody because he himself was. <laughs> Isaiah himself was stirring up. He's going, there's nobody else. It's like, I'm the only one. But good news, verse 8, but now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we, are, we all are the work of thy hand. And uh, he's just saying, please, Lord, don't be wroth. Don't be angry anymore. Don't remember our iniquity forever. You know, there's a time when God brings the iniquity to light. And then he's got to visit it. He's got to visit it. Right? I mean, we've read that scripture in Psalms. Let me pull it real quick. Where is it? I dig in here in my mind. There it is, right? Is it? Yeah. Uh, Psalm 89. He says, um, Psalm 89, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod. Psalm 89, verse 31 and 32. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquities. That means I'll visit their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. So the truth is, if you're truly in Christ and you're one of his sheep, you're going to make it to the end. That's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. Okay, but if you as a sheep break his commandments, you stop watching, you start straying, then he's got to, he's got to, when those iniquities come before his eyes, he's got to visit it with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. He's got to whip us. He's got, it's going to hurt. Why? Because he's bringing us back, purging it, keeping us from the evil so that we can stay on the path, right? Hebrews chapter 12. This is really important. I think this ties in to the whole message of today of persevering and continuing. Again, Hebrews 12, <clears throat> our brother was talking about we got to finish with the Lord set before us. Sometimes we want to be finished with it, but we're not finished with it. He's not finished with it in us. So don't cut it short. Okay, don't cut it short. When he cuts it short, and sometimes he does, sometimes he sees. Okay, you know what? Like for instance, uh, the days of great tribulation says he'll cut those days short because otherwise no, no flesh would be saved. If he let that thing run the full course, everybody would die on the earth. So he actually is going to cut it short for his elect's sake. So again, there's certain things, but he's got to do it, okay? We don't cut it short when we want, okay? We don't say we're done if he's not done. Wait till he says it's done. So we're running a race with patience, amen? And we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, you know? This isn't just us. We might feel like Isaiah, but we're not Isaiah. And even Isaiah might have felt alone in his day and age. <clears throat> but the truth is, he had the scriptures, and he could look back at David and Moses and Samuel and the other prophets that came before him and stir his heart, you know? Okay. So he says, lay aside every weight, amen? Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, okay? I don't know what that sin is, but there is a sin that easily besets us. You know, some sin is more easy for some of us than others, and other sins are not really that appealing to us, and some it's easy to fall, and he goes, lay lay it aside. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He pressed through until it was finished. He didn't stop. Pressed through until it was finished. Until he could sit, be received by the Father. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. Okay, so sometimes the sin that we're fighting against and the sinners around us that we're, we're, we're not fighting with them, but we're fighting against their sin, it's a real spiritual battle. Sometimes you get weary and you want to faint, just give up and just, ugh, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. And he's going, just stop. Consider Christ. Remember, part of that verse, part of, of waiting for him is remembering him in all his ways. I find that when you get away from the Gospels, if you get away from the Gospels and really pressing into Christ, and, uh, and you start kind of neglecting the Bible, and you just start hanging out and having coffee with, with other modern believers, you can start getting a different spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit. And you convince yourself it's the Holy Spirit and you're all doing great. But when you start considering Christ and all his ways, yo, it like quickens you. I don't know, we naturally, especially in this day and age, most of us, we weren't raised to be warriors. We weren't raised to be real men. We were raised in a, in a day of entertainment and fun and amusement parks and, and, and play. And so we're not like, we don't have the minds of the soldiers, you know? And so naturally, especially when you live in this comfort and stuff, you naturally just want to start conscious. Let's take it easy and let's just relax. And... But you read Jesus, man, it quickens you, it sharpens you. You go, man, he was like, he always spoke the truth. He was always, he never, I never, oh, let me just leave. No, you know, it's like, and it just quickens you to just get back on this thing. Like, okay, I thought what I had was bad, but actually look at what Jesus Christ did. Look at who he faced up against. Now, I might feel like I'm facing the Pharisees, but I ain't facing the Pharisees. I'm facing some lukewarm modern Christians. Like, you know what I mean? like I'm facing maybe some, whatever, I don't know, I won't name names. But I'm just saying, like, he was facing the religious, staunchest religious leaders of, the, of Israel. That's the top nation of God's people. These are the people that are the most driven, the most successful on earth. He's facing the top of the top, and he's coming against all of them. And he doesn't compromise an inch. And they're trying every which way to stumble him, and he just shut him down. Shut him, you know, like, and he's going, just, just relax. You haven't resisted on the blood. Jesus Christ resisted sin to the point where it was blood. It was blood. Remember, there's a time to shake the dust off your feet and move on. But then there's a time to come back and face it. So Jesus, there was a season when it wasn't time for him to really face the evil fully in its face. He would face it, and then he'd go. Face it, and then he'd go. And he'd city to city, and he'd come back to Jerusalem, and he'd cry out against it, and he'd rip through the sin, and then he'd, and he'd go. But then there came a time when he's going to face this evil all the way until that veil is ripped in twain. And that veil was... How thick, you know, top to bottom, that thing's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rip this thing. Like you talk about force and power and, but he's fighting in a spiritual realm, not a physical realm. He's not bringing fists. And it eventually came to the point where the way I'm going to beat this thing, I've corrected, I've rebuked, I've preached, I've warned. Now I've said enough. Now it's time for me to let them pour out their evil on me. Because that's going to be the only hope some of them might get saved. Because there's so much evil in them and they hate me so much. You know what I'm saying? The only hope, let them, let them take it out. Let them pour it out. Let them beat, let them rip, let them mock, let them just to the point of blood. He's not fighting with them. He's fighting with the sin in them. He's fighting with the evil in them. He's fighting with the corruption in their hearts. He strove on the blood. He's just going, look, you haven't resisted on the blood. So, so let's not be weary. Verse 5. 
You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. One of the things I've realized is if I'm getting whipped, if I am getting whipped and then I want to give up or I want to pull out, that's because somewhere I've sinned or I've disobeyed or I've missed the mark or I've turned aside. Almost always. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not going to say for sure, but maybe once or twice is where it was really, I was just taking it from others, for others. And you, and, you, and you get weary and you get to the point where, but usually it's like if you're getting swallowed up or if you're getting pulled out, usually some of you've also made a mistake. Not saying that others haven't, not saying others haven't done you wrong, but you also somewhere, like he said, if they break my commandments, if they don't keep my statutes, I'm going to visit their their transgression with the rod. I'm going to whip them. I'm going to chasten them. And he's saying, you've forgotten this. So if you're getting chastened, take it as a good sign. Don't despise it. Go, hey, this is actually, hey, this is proof. I am a child of God. I am one of his. Thank you, Lord, for chastening me. I was going off. I started slipping a little bit. Now you're keeping me on the way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son he receiveth. But notice, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. And then he says, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And go on and go on. But uh, verse, verse 9, he says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? How do you live? <laughs> You need to be in subjection to the Father of Spirits. That's how you receive life. If you withdraw, if you pull out, you're not going to be submitted to Him. No life. Verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but He for our profit. He's actually doing it for our good, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. It seems to be grievous. Nevertheless, let's not look at right now. Let's look at afterward. Look at the, what it yields. Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So watch, watch the exhortation. Verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So again, notice, okay, we're supposed to be looking at Jesus, laying aside everything, pressing to him. We're fighting against sin, but sometimes it gets rough. And sometimes we give in a little. Sometimes we turn aside a little bit. And you know what? Bam, he visits us with the rod. Bam, he visits us with stripes. Ah, it hurts. Lord, this isn't nice. Ah, and he's going, don't give up. In fact, don't despise it. Just take it as a good thing. Receive the correction. Honor him. Give him the reverence. Be subject unto him. And look at what it's going to yield. Don't, don't, I know right now it doesn't feel good. But it's going to yield good fruit, peaceable fruit, righteousness, all that stuff. This is so you can partake of His holiness. And the idea is, when you start getting weary, lift it up. Press through. Straight paths. Don't let it turn aside of the way. Don't let, look, if it's lame, let it be healed. You know, there's, sometimes there's time where you need to just lay low and allow something to heal. If something's broken, let it be healed. But once it's healed... Keep pressing in the straight way. Don't turn aside. Amen? <clears throat> Why? Because he's our father. We are the clay. He's our potter. We are the work of his hand. That's why we have to submit and be subject unto him. 
And he's going, please don't be angry forever because we're your people. At this time, in Isaiah's history, the holy cities were a wilderness. Zion was a wilderness. Jerusalem was a desolation. The holy and beautiful house where our fathers prayed it's thee is burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. It's ironic. In the New Testament, he talks about that burning lust for the opposite sex where you start messing around and start fornication. He calls it burning. And Paul says, better to marry than to burn. And he goes, look, they're all burned up with fire. And how many churches today are just burned up with just fornic- I mean, just fornicators in there. Even sodomites are welcome. People just living uncleanness, living with their girlfriend, living with their boy. No, there's no honor. There's no sanctity. There's no holiness. Desolation. And he cries out, verse 12, Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? And then the Lord responds, and it's beautiful. He says, I'm sought of them that ask not for me. I'm found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. So in Isaiah 65, what you see then is you see these two people. There's the people that he spread out his hands all day to. They're rebellious people that refuse to walk in his ways. They walk after their own thoughts. They provoke him to anger continually. And they think they're holy, but everything is done in uncleanness. And he guarantees that they're going to be destroyed. They're going to be given to the slaughter. They're going to be burned up. He's going to, be, he's going to, he's going to destroy them. But then... There's a people that they weren't even looking for the Lord and the Lord, and they found him. They weren't even asking for him. Boom, there he was, and they had him. And, and again, this is prophetic of the Gentiles, how Christ would turn to the Gentiles, turn from Israel, this rebellious, stubborn people who he kept reaching out to, and they just would not hearken. How he turned to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles would receive him. And, uh, and he says, just like the new wine is found in the cluster and one says, destroy it not. Don't destroy that cluster of grapes. There's, there's wine that we can get out of that. There's a blessing in it. And he goes, that's what I'll do for my servants' sakes. These are the ones who serve me. They're true to me. They, they, they honor me. They're waiting for me. They're working righteousness. They're, they're sanctifying me in their hearts. And he promises rest, provision, Joy, rejoicing, sustenance, blessing to those people. And so again, when you look at verses 11 through uh, 14 or 15, it's beautiful. You see it going back. Again, he's speaking to most of the nation, Israel. Ye are they that forsake the Lord, forget my holy mountain, prepare a table for that troop. Uh, Again, the troop he's talking about are these, these unclean, they were doing unclean sacrifice, all the stuff he was talking about in the earlier verses. And he goes, I'm going to number you to the sword. I'm going to do this. Verse 13, Therefore thus say, Lord, behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. My servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. You shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That's exactly what he did. In 70 AD, he wiped Jerusalem off the map, destroyed the temple, and the servants of the Lord were no longer called Israel. They were called Christian. Call them by another name, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The true servants of the Lord. They didn't, they didn't bow to the temple. They didn't bow to the sacrifices. They bowed to the Messiah of the temple, the Messiah of the sacrifices, the one who gave all things. They bowed to him. Verse 16, that he who blesseth himself on the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth. He said, I came to bear witness of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He's the God of truth. We cannot compromise truth and have peace. 
God wants us to have unity in the body of Christ, but not unity at the expense of truth. Not unity at the expense of true doctrine. No. Those who will swear by the God, by God and bless themselves in God, it's going to be in the God of truth. So important. The church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. And then for the rest of the chapter, you have the promise of the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem that the Lord's going to create for his people that he will rejoice in, that he will joy in, where there'll be no more sorrow or weeping or crying. Yeah, thank you, Lord. There'll be no more young baby that dies, no more infinite days that dies. If someone dies at 100 years old, it'll be considered like, oh, he was just a baby, he was just a kid. Because he said he'll die at 100 years old. That'll, that'll be a baby dying. There'll be no little ones dying. Oh, why did they, why did the Lord? Mm -mm. All that evil, all that junk will be gone. And even the sinner, he's going to get 100 years old. He's going to get 100 years to try and figure things out. And then, if after 100 years he doesn't figure out, then we'll be accursed. <laughs> sinner being 100 years old will be accursed. So again, God's forbearance. He's patient. He gives, you know, okay, that's a sinner. I don't just judge him and destroy him. I give him time. I give him time. Eventually, though, it comes a point where you cross the line, now you're accursed. You can't. You're like Cain. He was a curse. There's no chance he's ever going to get saved. Full-blown child of the devil. And, uh, yo, how beautiful. 21. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And then tree lives a long time. He's going, that's, that's my people. Mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. Love this phrase, for they are the seed, not the seed of the Lord, although they are the seed of the Lord, but they're the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. The seed of the blessed of the Lord. Who is the blessed of the Father? It's Jesus Christ. <laughs> and they are the seed of Christ. They're the seed of the blessed of the Lord, which is why when Jesus comes, First thing he teaches, every is a repent, kingdom of God is at hand, kingdom of God is at hand. What does he teach? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed, right? He's, he's the blessed of the Lord. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And guess what? Now he's going to bring seed as he speaks, bringing forth a seed. And what's, what's that seed? Blessing, not cursing. Jesus didn't come to bring cursed seed. He came to bring blessed seed so that we could be in the blessed of the Lord. We could be the seed of the blessed Lord. We could be blessed of him. Amen? Again, he revealed the truth, how you actually enter the true blessing of the Lord, how you actually enter into the true Jesus Christ. Paul warned, it's going to be people come and bring in other Jesuses, preach in other Jesuses. That Jesus can't bless you. I mean, he might be able to bless you with temporary things, with earthly things, yeah. promotions and jobs and things like that. But the true blessing that's of God, that peace that passes all understanding, that thing that keeps your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, so much so. And again, Lord, I, I don't know if I'm quite there yet. I'm going, please, God, help me. Jesus said, when you're really blessed of him, you're really in him and you're serving him. When they cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, when they're speaking it, he goes, you rejoice and be exceeding glad. And we see the apostles, they did that. When they were beaten, dude, they weren't going like, ah, oh, did we do something wrong? Or maybe we misstepped, or did I miss the Holy Spirit's leading here? They're going, yeah. We were worthy to be to count to be counted worthy to, to suffer shame for his name. That's real Christianity. That's the true blessed of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? That's what I want. I want it to where, man, I'm getting beat for Jesus and I'm going, glory to God. Thank you. Where, where people are coming against me and lies and, and accusations and all this and you're just rejoicing and you go, thank you, Lord. You suffered it. And I'm so glad I get to suffer it with you just a little bit. Just a little bit. I get to partake of what you suffered. Love it the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. 
24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Man, how many times in the Old Testament you see people calling and crying and calling and crying? And, you know, sometimes it takes a little while for God to show up and do something. But there are certain things that are in the way. But here he goes, before they call, I'm answering. Already there. I'm giving them an answer before they even knew what to ask for. <laughs> Love it. While they're yet speaking, I'm hearing. I'm already tuned in. I got like before they're just starting to speak, and I already know the whole thing they're gonna say, and I already got the, the answer they need coming. And what's the result of this? What's the result of when God puts away the evil, makes all things new? His servants, the ones who waited for him, the ones who rejoiced in him and worked righteousness and, and, and sanctified him in their hearts. The wolf and the lamb, enemies, creatures that used to be enemies, a, a predatory creature and a prey creature, one that would attack the other. They'll, they'll feed together. The lion is going to eat straw like the bullock. Dust shall be the serpent's meat. There's another passage where he says the kid's going to put his hand in the, in the, in the asp's hole. And they're not going to bite him. The serpent will just eat dust. <laughs> they, won't, they won't destroy. They won't hurt. And all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yo. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I'm found of them, right? That sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me. Unto a nation was not called by my name. But he said, I'll cut them off and I'll call my servants by another name. I think it's important. Paul said, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. This is why it's so important to understand who is Christ. Because if I'm going to bear that name, I better understand what that means. And when you see Christ, holiness, truth, Purity, honesty, kindness, gentleness, no compromise. Would not rest or stop. Yeah, you might pause for a second, sleep on the boat a little bit, sit down at the well, you know, get a drink. But I mean, he knew. I'm not stopping until I fulfill what the Father sent me to fulfill. I'm not going to be turned aside to the right or the left. And even when the beatings start coming, I'm pressing through till this thing is finished and I sit with my Father in His kingdom. And so even with us, you know, there's seasons down here on earth, sometimes a season of war, we're going out warring, sometimes season of rest, sometimes there's seasons for love, and sometimes there's seasons for, you know, a little bit more straightening. Different seasons. Seasons come and go. In certain seasons, sometimes we're kind of like over the season and you're like, oh, it's time for the next season and you're waiting. And, but again, let's finish as the Lord sees fit, what he wants to finish in that season. But even in that, let's understand it's not finished. Until we're sitting with the Lord Jesus in his kingdom and eating and drinking at the table of our Father in heaven, it's not done. Amen? But let's remember, this life is like a vapor. It's like a vapor. There's something about time. When you're in it, it seems like it's taken forever. But when you look back, you're like, where'd that thing go? Yeah. Just, like, just like Moses said, a thousand years in thy sight. It's like, it was like nothing. It was just came and gone. And uh, how much more man? You know, we're like grass, flower. So be strong. Be of good courage. Let's continue in the things of the Lord. He'll show us. He'll make the way straight. Uh, let's not turn aside out of the way. Strengthen the the feeble knees and the hands which hang down make straight paths for our feet and uh, may God direct our, our, our path in truth. Amen? Amen. Amen.